Okay, so in this part, I'll introduce the data sets for our three languages and show the evaluation results on this data for an unsupervised finite state model that I've introduced in the previous section and an unsupervised sequence to sequence one. So for Arabic, we used the LDC Bold dataset, which consists of SMS and chat dialogues between Egyptian Arabic speakers written in Romanized Arabic or so-called Arabizi. The messages were semi-automatically converted to Arabic script, specifically to a standard called conventional orthography for dialectal Arabic, because dialectal Arabic by itself doesn't have a standardized orthography. For Canada, we use Dakshina, a corpus of romanization and native script data for uh, 12 South Asian languages. Unlike Arabic, the texts are from Canada Wikipedia, and they are originally written in Canada script, and the romanizations of those sentences are then elicited from native speakers. Because of this, we might have less diversity on the romanized side, but there will probably be more spelling variation in the native script. And finally, for Russian, we collect and partially annotate our own data set. We scrape the romanized text from a social network, vk.com. And for the native script side, we use a portion of the Taiga corpus, which is also scraped from the same platform. And although uh, these uh, two portions of the data are collected from the same website, the Taiga data seems to be mostly from political discussion groups. So the vocabulary of that part is very skewed compared to our collected Romanized data. So to collect this Romanized data, we use Romanizations of common words as queries, as uh, Darvish 2014 has done for Arabizi. I just took a list of most common Russian words, and for each word, generated all the Romanizations I could think of. And then we use them as search queries. So that way we're using a, we're getting a diverse set of user preferences in our data. Uh, then I manually removed the sentences that weren't in Russian because the query Romanization sometimes happen to be identical to words in other languages. This could to some extent be performed automatically using a language identification module. But I saw, for example, some results in uh, Romanized Ukrainian and to filter those out, you really need a native speaker. Um, then the validation and test portions of the data were manually annotated by two native speakers. The training portion we didn't annotate because our approach is unsupervised. The annotators uh, remove all the foreign words and all the other words for which we, they don't have a, a standard uh, Cyrillic spelling in mind. And here we show this part in red. Then the annotators manually convert the rest of the sequence to Cyrillic and correct what they perceive as minor misspellings, like the hyphenation here in blue. And this is this kind of correction is kind of a sensitive matter. Uh, we are dealing with a creative phenomenon, so we would actually want to preserve the author intent as much as possible. It's just not clear when and how to do it. Like, how do you introduce an equivalent misspelling on the output side? Or um, how do you tell if this kind of spelling is intentional or if it's a typo that the author themselves would like you to correct? And of course, the annotator is always limited by their own dialect. Uh, for example, I was one of the principal annotators and very likely I couldn't recognize and preserve some dialectal variations in texts uh, that have been authored by people from other countries or other areas of Russia. And um, when I was describing the model, uh, all the time I was talking about characters, but in fact, we are working with Unicode code points. For Russian and even for Arabic, it's perfectly fine. But for South Asian languages like Canada, there is this whole other set of challenges associated with Unicode, which is again, why our formalism isn't language independent. So in Canada script, many consonant characters carry a default vowel like ka carries an a. If you want to express a different vowel like u, you add a modifying diacritic that merges with ka. And if you want just the consonant without any vowel, you again add an, another diacritic called virama. All of those diacritics are separate Unicode symbols. Some of them correspond to vowels, some of them correspond to nothing. The base character stands either for a consonant or for a consonant vowel syllable, depending on whether it has diacritics. And uh, an example would be um, 
th this uh, name, Rajkumar. Uh, it kind of looks like it has five or six characters if you look just at the Kannada sequence. Um, but in fact, it's made up of 11 Unicode symbols, one of which is non-printing, this zero width non-joiner, this weird block in the middle. Uh, it's there to prevent uh, the two separate roots merging together. It also commonly appears in foreign words, of which there is a lot in Wikipedia. And um, again, we are treating it as a separate symbol. Another problem is that there's more than one way to represent some characters. For example, this table comes from the Unicode standard documentation, and it shows that you can get visually identical results by either using a single character or by combining two parts. So the takeaway here is that linguistic typology matters uh, in more ways than you would expect, even for seemingly technical aspects of our work. So now let's see some results. This graph uh, shows character error rate, so lower is better. The FST without an informative prior doesn't do particularly well. But with the visual prior, we see a lot of improvement for Russian. For Arabic, we don't have a visual prior because, as I said, there weren't enough mappings in the Unicode confusables list. Uh, a phonetic prior is even better than the visual one, um, which uh, aligns with our observation that people generally prefer phonetic substitutions to visual ones. And uh, combining the phonetic and the visual mappings in one prior gives the best result. So now if we look at the performance of the supervised version of the same model that we've actually trained on some amount of parallel data, we can see that our uh, model with the combined prior actually came pretty close. So the informative priors, this inductive bias can actually help close this gap between supervision and no supervision. And we also compare to two handcrafted decoders available online. They're actually doing a little bit better than our supervised model. So now let's look at what kind of errors the FST model makes. They are mostly character level noise, and they are usually caused by a failure to disambiguate between two plausible predictions. Uh, so these graphs uh, here visualize fragments of confusion matrices for Arabic and for Russian. And uh, here's an example of the WFSD converting a character based on visual similarity when the author was actually using a phonetic substitution. Uh, another type of error is inability to handle digraphs. Like here, instead of uh, decoding SH into one character, it decodes S and H separately. This is also probably due to a weak Engram language model because we'd expect the language model to downweight the unlikely native script bigrams. And some confusion, as we expected, is caused by the noise in priors. Like here, the model incorrectly deciphers Latin X as the Russian soft sign. Russian soft sign indicates palatalization. And um, this is happening because uh, X and soft sign were randomly mapped to the same key in one of the phonetic keyboard layouts, although there isn't any phonetic correspondence between them. But we did bias our model towards learning this mapping. Uh, so now it's trying to apply it here. So now we've seen both the good and the bad sides of the final finite state model. It is structured, which makes it easy to encode constraints and the information about the underlying process. And also it's easier to interpret its predictions. Uh, they can also learn from relatively small data and perform exact maximization. But both training and inference take a lot of time with FSTs. And as I mentioned, the Ingram character language model is weak. Um, an alternative would be a neural sequence to sequence model, which is less structured, but more powerful. And the name sequence to sequence usually implies supervised, like you're training it, training it on parallel sequences. But here we're going to use this term to refer to an unsupervised neural model. So an RNN language model would be stronger. We could also perform inference much faster, but compared to an FST, it needs more training data. And also it can't do exact maximization. So it's prone to search errors. 
um, we're going to compare their performance on the decipherment task. And I wanted to again emphasize that we're training them both without supervision. So most of the intuitions that I've shared here for both finite state and neural models are, you know, they come from the analysis done on supervised tasks because the supervised setup is a lot more common. So that's just something to keep in mind while we're looking at the results. But before we get to that, let me introduce our sequence to sequence approach. So it is unsupervised neural machine translation or UNMT introduced by Lample et al. And it maps both the source and the target sequences to a latent space. And it is trained to denoise and reconstruct sentences in the same domain perform a back translation by going through the latent space and uh, to distinguish uh, between sentences from different domains. We are using the probabilistic formulation of the same approach introduced by Junxian He and colleagues, where uh, the representation of the sentence in another domain is actually treated as a latent variable that the observed text is conditioned on. Uh, so here it's shown as translating between two domains. In our case, one domain is Romanized text and the other domain is native script text. Um, because the strengths of these two models are so complementary, we are also going to explore some model combinations. The easiest way to combine two separate models is re-ranking, where one model generates its top K list of most likely candidates and then the other model scores them and chooses the best one. Our second approach is product of ex experts, which is a, a little bit more complicated. It's a joint decoding strategy where we perform beam search on the um, finite state lattice, and each possible next symbol is reweighted by its probability under the sequence to sequence model at the corresponding time step. Transitions that correspond to deletions uh, so arcs that output epsilon are not reweighted because they don't correspond to anything on the seek to seek side. Like the neural model is just not aware that any transition happened. So because of those deletions, we can't group hypotheses uh, on the beam by their length as we would usually do. So instead we group them by length of the input sequence, uh, the portion of the input sequence that has been consumed so far. And we train the models separately and combine them at test time. Uh, so let's come back to the results. First, I wanted to show the results for the two base, base models. But I wanted to start with a disclaimer to say that this isn't some abstract fair comparison of an unsupervised FST and an unsupervised seek to seek uh, These are trained on different amounts of data because the FST was too slow to train on all available data. And the seek to seek just didn't work if we trained it on just the part of the data that the FST was using. So we're doing this experiment not to make any general conclusions about the two model classes. We're just trying to see how these separately trained models can be used and combined. So this graph uh, shows character error rate, so lower is better. And on character level, the FSTs are doing better for all three languages, again, despite having less training data. This is the character error rate for the model combinations. They have different level of effectiveness, but mostly they're just kind of in between the scores of the two base models. So instead of uh, bringing together the strengths to cover their weak spots, uh, they just kind of interpolate between the behaviors of the two base models. And the re-ranked FST actually performs uh, a tiny bit better than the base FST. And product of experts also helps a little in one case. Here we're showing word error rate. So lower is better again. But uh, we have the opposite picture. Unsupervised sequence to sequence model is better than FST on word level except for Canada for some reason. Model combinations, again, are scoring mostly in between. And again, re-ranking either helps a little or at least doesn't make it worse. And uh, finally, another word level metric blue. Here, higher is better. Again, uh, 
the observations here are similar to what we saw for a word error rate. Uh, unsupervised sequence to sequence models are doing better on word level for Russian and Arabic, but not for Canada. And again, re-ranking uh, occasionally helps a little bit. Um, so now I wanted to share some comparative error analysis. I'm going to use Russian as uh, the illustrative language here because I can actually read it, unlike the other two languages. That's also a problem of working with a variety of scripts. Um, so we've seen quantitatively for Russian that uh, the FST is doing better on character level and the seek to seek is doing better on word level. So here's what it looks like in the actual outputs. I'm showing both the Cyrillic outputs uh, on the left and their scientific transliterations on the right for those who don't read Cyrillic. So the FST typically predicts the right words, but uh, almost always with some character level corruption. Like you can see, there is a little bit of red here in almost every word. The seek to seek, uh, the unsupervised neural model, is uh, good at reconstructing entire words, but then it just gets derailed into hallucinating entirely unrelated words until it finally comes back on track. And uh, re-ranking the seek to seek with the WFST actually got rid of the hallucination in this case. Um, and the parts uh, that this one gets wrong, the parts highlighted in yellow, aren't exactly errors. They are discrepancies with the gold annotations that were introduced by the manual correction in the process of annotation. So uh, the re-ranked sequence to sequence model is actually faithfully rendering the input. It's just getting penalized for not performing spelling and grammar correction at the same time. Um, so I wanted to share some uh, high level takeaways now. And uh, the first one is that uh, model combinations still suffer from search issues. We know that sequence to sequence model have search issues like they delete or hallucinate words, they produce repetitions or empty outputs. Um, and uh, we were expecting that the model combinations would um, help with them and they do to some extent, but not as much as we hoped which is why their scores are mostly in between the two base models. And uh, at least for re-ranking, the issue is beam search. So something we've frequently observed is the same hallucination making its way to all the hypotheses in the final beam. And I'm going to illustrate it now with this example. Here I'm showing the Romanized input, the Cyrillic output, and the rough English translation of the sentence. And these are the top five final hypotheses that the unsupervised neural model generates uh, for this input and their scores according to the finite state tree ranker. So what is happening here? Uh, seek to seek is hallucinating something early in the sentence because the language model just gets immediately distracted by the first character in the input. So instead of the word this, which is the correct prediction, it predicts United Russia, a name of a political party, which has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the sentence. Uh, and then it comes back on track and predicts the rest correctly for as long as we let it go on. But it's just not good enough. The Rirenka can no longer help with anything here because the hallucination is just too far off. So we either need a much larger beam size for this or a diversity promoting search mechanism. So how did the word this become United Russia? Um, remember that our Cyrillic data comes from political discussion groups. So names of the political parties and politicians are disproportionately common on the native script side. Uh, the sequence to sequence language model gets distracted by the first character of the Romanized sequence. And if you look uh, at the Cyrillic here, the, um, on the Cyrillic side, the first characters of uh, the gold and the predicted um, outputs are actually uh, different. So it just um, looks at the first character of the input and just goes on to predict what it memorized. And here's another example of the same. Uh, here, instead of the extremely common word life, the seek to seek predicts a politician's name. Again, not even getting the first Cyrillic character right. 
And if we extract word level edit operations required to transform the ground truth into the prediction, then 25% um, of the most frequent word level substitutions are of this kind, where the predicted word is a political one. And that's compared to nearly 3% for the FST. That's notable because the neural model is actually better at not predicting out of vocabulary words than the FST is. It's just sensitive to domain mismatch. And the last point I wanted to make here is that the FST errors are more repetitive. For example, here I'm showing the most populated fragments of the character 11 confusion matrices for the two base models. You can see that the left one corresponding to the unsupervised FST is notably sparser. If we look more closely at this row here, well, you can see that um, instead of the letter ya, uh, the FST most often predicts a, uh, and uh, the other substitutions are relatively rare compared to that. But um, for the seek to seek, the distribution of errors for ya is much closer to uniform. Um, although the errors uh, involving a prediction of relevant characters uh, are a little bit more likely than the rest, it's not by that much. Um, so um, it's not, the errors are less repetitive for the sequence to sequence model. So that suggests that the FST errors might be easier to correct with some kind of rule based post processing. And this is the end of part three. And in the final part, I'm going to discuss the possible directions for future work and share some final thoughts.